One of my favorite shows on television is For All Mankind. It tells an alternate version of the space race. And this show is known for its scientific accuracy, which makes sense because we're actually dealing with historical space travel. But there's a particular scene at the end of the first episode of season two, which just came out last night, that I want to talk to you about because I wondered, is that really scientifically accurate? Let's talk about that together. I'm Luke, and this is Polymathy. One of the creators of For All Mankind is Ronald Dean Moore, who made the just outstanding series, the reimagined Battlestar Galactica from about 15 years ago, which also is known for its realistic qualities in a space environment, as well as being a really good show with outstanding characters, cinematography, visuals of all kinds, sound, and music. And For All Mankind is really amazing just like that. And what I'm going to tell you now is going to be a spoiler for the first episode. So if you haven't seen it, go and see the first 10 minutes and then come back. So, spoiler alert of the very beginning of the first episode. In 1969, the Soviets landed on the moon in June, a whole month before the Americans did. Which means that the Soviet N-1 rocket, instead of having a lot of colossal failures, which is what happened in our timeline, it successfully did bring astronauts cosmonauts, rather, to the surface of the moon first, weeks before the Americans did. While the Apollo 11 mission more or less happens as it was intended in our timeline, what this does is it completely changes space history. When the Soviets were unable to get their N-1 rocket to work, while NASA was able to bring lots of astronauts to the moon, that essentially ended the space race, at least for the moon itself, since that was the stated goal and one of the biggest fears of the Cold War. For the Americans, it was the idea of a red moon, a moon controlled by the Soviets, which could be a staging ground for warlike activities, etc. And of course, the Soviets had the exact same concerns that the Americans might do the same thing. And none of that happened because there wasn't any competition of other countries landing astronauts on the moon, except the United States. So the consequence of this is a ramping up of the space race, an increase in technological development like we've only been able to dream of more recently. For example, in season two, we see that electric cars are a thing in the 80s because long-lasting batteries are needed for lunar rovers for all of the astronauts that are on the moon. And other things like two-way video conversation being more of a norm, and even flat screens in 1983. So the whole series is fantastic, wonderfully written. The premise is just fascinating because of how interesting. It's essentially the space program that we should have gotten but didn't get, which makes sense because the only way we would have gotten colonies on the moon would be if there were enough political pressure to do so. And the political pressure just evaporated in the 70s. So the dream that many people had in the 60s and 70s of lunar colonies, of human Mars exploration, a lot of that's starting to finally happen now, mostly powered by the great ingenuity of companies like SpaceX, cooperating, of course, with NASA and other governmental agencies around the world. So that's what For All Mankind is about. If you've already seen season one, fantastic. But now I'm definitely going to give you a spoiler for the first episode of season two, so you should watch it and then come back and see the rest of this video. So at the end of this first episode, an ESA astronaut from the Republic of Ireland, which is really cool, by the way, is up on Skylab, which is still there in 1983. Coronal mass ejection verified. This is a major solar event. I mean, it's well into S5, bigger than anything recorded in our observations. And she observes a massive coronal ejection from the sun. The sun has not just solar flares, but enormous solar prominences. And these have been documented throughout history. And in the modern era, with electricity and electronics, they can wreak all kinds of havoc on spacecraft and very powerful solar storms, although mostly are deflected by the magnetic fields of the Earth and even the atmosphere, sometimes can actually get into the atmosphere and cause massive blackouts. The March 1989 geomagnetic storm was really famous for this because it knocked out the Quebec power grid. So season two, episode one takes place in 1983. And in 1983, as far as I've been able to find, there wasn't such a big solar storm. But in this timeline, there is, which ends up creating a very interesting situation. Because on the moon, there are NASA astronauts. And these astronauts have to get to shelter. And then when we see the solar storm hit, we see something that I thought at first was unbelievable and rather unscientific, which is we see that the radiation from the sun is impacting the surface of the moon and causing the lunar dust to just get kicked up by it, as if it were being sprayed by water or something, by a whole bunch of uh, plasma or the like. And I thought, ah, oh, no, that can't be right at all. I mean, maybe 
if the solar wind, but they make a point of telling us in the episode, this isn't a typical geomagnetic storm, which takes perhaps days to reach the Earth or the moon. We're looking at a few billion tons of solar material being ejected into space and heading this way. Is it dangerous? The Earth's magnetic field will filter out most of the hard radiations. Everyone outside of Earth's atmosphere is at risk. They never trained for anything this fast. Coronal mass ejections usually take days to travel from the sun to the moon. It's traveling at 30% the speed of light that this is a massive ejection of particles which are moving at a third the speed of light. So they only have less than a half an hour in order to actually get to cover. So it's a very strange, very unique event. And I'm thinking, well, these are subatomic particles. They're just going to fly right through everything. They're not going to make dust kick up in this fashion. It looks really good, but that, ah, oh, this can't be scientifically accurate at all. But I did a little bit of research, and then, of course, I remembered, oh, right, these aren't neutrons or alpha particles, uh, those are both neutrally charged. Neutrons are part of the nuclei of atoms, and alpha particles are the equivalent of the nuclei of a helium atom. And both are neutrally charged. Both are dangerous forms of radiation, and typically generated in nuclear power or nuclear weapons, for example. And they're quite dangerous. But what's coming out of the sun are protons. But this isn't a CME. This is hard proton radiation. That's deadly. And they're positively charged. And then I also remembered that lunar dust is also negatively charged. And this is actually from the interaction with the solar wind over millions, in fact, billions of years. So the interaction of a storm of positively charged particles from the sun with very light, very fine, uh, very low mass lunar dust and getting pulled up in this way is a little bit more like the interaction of lightning on the Earth, where you have one charge from the atmosphere interacting with charges from the ground, which meet together. So the lunar dust is pulled up towards these almost uh, magnetic field lines, these, I assume, waves of, uh, of protons. That might be what we're being shown here, that look something like waves of, uh, of protons that are going across the surface and making this amazing and beautiful and absolutely terrifying effect. And since this is one of the most powerful storms from the sun that's seen in this timeline, it can maybe be that powerful that you'd actually be able to see it. To my knowledge, we've never observed anything quite like this on the moon, but after reading this paper, which I'm going to link in the description, it looks like, yeah, maybe this actually could be how it would look on the moon if there were a really, really powerful solar storm. And the scene, just to you know, throw in some more spoilers, uh, is really uh, cool and terrifying because most of the crew, there's, it looks like, nearly a dozen of uh, NASA on the moon at this time is able to take shelter inside of the base, inside a radiation shelter. Whereas astronaut Molly Cobb, she was up doing some prospecting and uh, geological research up on a cliff, and she has to hurry down and shelter in place inside a lava tube. And she's at one of her colleagues from the European Space Administration, who's of course partnering with NASA on the moon, is stuck out there. He's not able to get back in time. He seems to be unconscious. And so she goes out into what must be a horrifying amount of radiation in order to go to try to save his life. So uh, you'll have to see the rest of the episode and the rest of the season to find out what happens. But if you are a heliophysicist, because I'm, I'm not a heliophysicist, at first I thought this like, ah, it doesn't seem right at all. And uh, if you've already seen the show, you might have thought that too. Uh, but then looking at it a little bit, it's like, oh, this actually might be a way it could look. And maybe it's, and not only is it really beautiful and really great looking for the show and terrifying and great for the scene, the music and everything is fantastic. The cinematography, it's beyond belief how good and how real it all looks. And maybe this is scientifically accurate completely, that it could look exactly like this. So if you know more about physics, if you know about heliophysics in particular and uh, interactions with the lunar dust and uh, you know how this should look, I would love to know. And uh, if I get enough uh, clear answers, I'll pin a comment eventually at the top of uh, the comment section so that we can, in fact, uh, know and, and appreciate that this is, in fact, scientifically accurate. So uh, I do strongly recommend the show for all mankind. Really, really amazing just for how much you can learn uh, about the space race in reality and how it compares with this really fascinating fiction that is just so close to what could have happened. And uh, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it.